you want to discuss the use of data for doing business? Okay, and specifically we're going to cover green air quality. There are lots and lots of ways that you can visualize numerical data based upon uh, current situation or on a specific circumstance, but there are three kind of main ways that you can visualize your data. Uh, one is kind of old, uh, it's called Stanley G. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but it's important to be able to recognize it and understand it uh, so we can understand what's actually being said. Uh, this is used a lot more in uh, before the advent of our computers. So a stunning use is a way that we can kind of gain and organize our data. So let's say that we were measuring the number of fish per hundred fish there are. Okay, so this would be a stem, so this would be like a pen, and this would be a one. This left-hand side is considered our stem column, and this one is our right-hand column, this is our stem, and this is our RNG. So the pen would be something like 20, 30, 60. And maybe you go out and you saw fish for the first time that you went out, or first time you came in, you saw So we saw 30 in the first time. We went out again, we saw 31. We go out again, we saw 20. This is the second time we then we saw 22. Then we saw 33 and 34, another 34. And we keep on adding. So this is our 10th place, the 20. And we could then ask questions like, how many times did you see 34 fish? Well, we saw that two times. We see 30 and 44. We saw it twice. And maybe we saw one set of 20 fish in the middle. So we get a nice little distribution, and we're able to uh, quickly visualize this information. The problem with this is that as you get a lot of data, it's really cumbersome to be able to have to take the exact number for every single observation. And that would take us then to a heat sink. So heat sand does very much the same thing, uh, only it's much more easily scaled. So let's make a heat sink. Okay, so let's do this again for our fish. So this time we'd say, okay, this is like zero, and then we could go to 10, and we could go to 20, and we could go to 30, and we could go to 40, and then we could go to 50. All right, so we've made our ranges, and we could say, okay, let's continue. Let's say we went out and even collected more data. There was, you know, a couple where we didn't see any fish or maybe very few. Then we saw some like this. And we can keep on going kind of like that. So we can kind of see that we're distributed. And over here, we can put just the frequency. So if this is a large count, you know, we could say that this was maybe a thousand observations. Or if we didn't have a lot, maybe that's just 10 observations up here. So this is much more easily scalable and produces very much the same information as the stem and the leaf. Histograms are very easy to do when we have our data uh, within a data set that either, that some sort of statistical package could analyze. All right, so let's do one more. And these are called box plots. And box plots are a quick way to summarize how our data looks. Sometimes they're done vertically, sometimes they're done horizontally, uh, but they're the same concept. We're going to work on them vertically. So we start with a minimum, and then we come up and we do another box, and we do another box, and we do another line. You're like, okay, what are each of these? Well, let's label these parts. This bottom is our minimum. The top is our maximum. And then our middle, we've got three values in the middle. The very middle one is our median, or the middle value of all of our data. Then we've got what's called Q1, which is quartile one, and we've got 
Q3, which is quartile three. And they're the middle points of like the upper 50% of the data and the lower 50% of the data. So these numbers, minimum Q1, median Q3, and maximum, are known as our five number summary. And we can also talk about our range. So max minus min, that is the range. And then we can also talk about another piece of info. This is called the IQR, or inner quartile range. Now what's interesting about each of these chunks is each of those chunks represent 25% of the data. So that chunk is 25, this one is 25%, this is 25 percent and this last one is also 25 percent so the inner quartile range lets us know where the middle 50 percent of the data is lying it kind of lets us know what is happening in the middle of our data all right so from this we can also learn what an outlier is sometimes you'll see an outlier as a little circle dot above or below the maximum or the minimum and that is so if we want an upper so the upper outlier equals Q3 plus 1.5 times IQR and lower equals Q1 minus 1.5 times IQR. So just to be really specific, the IQR is equivalent to Q3, sorry, Q3 minus Q1. That gives us what the IQR is. So this lets us know how far away from the upper limit of the IQR or the lower limit of the IQR we have to be before we consider a point uh, an outlier. So those are things that have happened so far away or so rare that they really don't describe what is happening in with our data. Um, so some other things too with our box plots is they can help us determine if a distribution is skewed or not. If you see how we have this big stretch to the top, well that lets us know that the upper end of our data is spread out over a wider range. If we see things spread out on the upper end, if we laid it down it would be all towards the right, we would call that um, being skewed to the right. Wherever your tail is, wherever your outliers are stretched out to, that's where your tail is. If it was to the lower end or to the left if it was horizontally, that would be a left skew. And so we can kind of talk about our distributions. Are they symmetrical? Are they skewed one way or another? And we can see lots of that just by looking at our box plots.